Hi, Jeff Bridgman here of Jeff R. Bridgman Antiques. I'm here today to tell you a tale of two eagles. These were carved by the two most prolific carvers of American eagles in the antiques world, John Haley Bellamy of Maine and then New Hampshire and Boston, and uh, George Staff of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Both worked in time periods that overlapped one another, but Bellamy was born significantly earlier. Let's start with him. So Bellamy was born in Kittery, Maine in 1836. That's the, open, that's the year of the, the Texas Revolution, to put some perspective on it. And he passed in, in 1914, the opening year of World War I in Europe. Uh, his father, Charles Garrish Bellamy, was a, a lumber selector for the U.S. Navy and a master craftsman and woodworker. Um, and in 1861, he went to work for the Navy uh, as being put in charge of both the Charlestown Navy Yard in Boston and the Portsmouth Navy Yard in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So John was also a woodworker, and he set up a woodworking shop in Kittery in the 1850s. And at some point there, probably when his father got hired uh, to actually run the Navy Yards, he was started to work uh, in Portsmouth. And then at some point during the war, it's not clear exactly when, he was moved to the uh, Boston waterfront and, uh, and the Boston Navy Yard. So, uh, the guys who worked for the Navy, they worked only about eight hours a day. Unlike if you worked for a commercial shipyard, you'd probably work 16 hours a day at the time. So when these guys had extra time, they would do other things. Now, Bellamy did not start out carving eagles right away. He was a, a, you know, a ship's carver for the Navy and did all sorts of things. And he was an uh, an engineer. He was a genius. He could build anything. He had 30 patents in his lifetime and was just a really well-respected guy. So even when the war ended and a whole lot of veterans were hired to take the place of guys who weren't um, in combat, and most of those guys that were in combat didn't like the guys that weren't, um, John Bellamy stayed on. I think probably one was his father's influence for sure, but another would have been his skill as just a master craftsman and a, and a fixer and inventor of just about anything. So he probably had great respect among his peers. In 1866, he opened a shop actually in Charleston, uh, in City Square in Charlestown, and it was his, his carving shop was on the first floor of a Masonic Lodge. So just by uh, his location, he ended up doing all sorts of Masonic things. This was his first specialty as a carver and an entrepreneur. And so even though he was a great artisan, he always considered himself more of a businessman and entrepreneur than he did as a carver. And the first things he did were things like mirrors with Masonic emblems and shelves and clocks, uh, etc. I have a couple here I can show you really quick, which are a lot of fun. This in black walnut is one of his typical whatnot shelves made uh, uh, by uh, his firm almost certainly. And you can see all the different Masonic symbols here, the G for God. And uh, down here we have the winged hourglass um time is time flies right i could go through the other symbols but you get the idea um this you can see here where there was probably a um uh, some sort of little box or maybe a stand for a pocket watch would be very appropriate in this particular uh behind this particular motif he was really an elaborate craftsman and a super highly skilled wood carver. And here is one of his mirrors. 
very detailed fretwork, very fancy, very fine. And he'd carve to order. And he was very successful at it. So in 1872, he moved back to New Hampshire and he carved there some, I believe, as an apprentice and then, and then just started, uh, he got a job uh, to carve an eagle for a guy out in the Isles of Shoals, which sort of bridge uh, between Maine and uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And when he did that, he carved two of them. One for stock, so he carved one for the, for the client uh, under contract, and he bought one for stock and sold it, and then found out they were pretty easy to sell. And within just a year, he'd carved so many of them for uh, ship stern boards, for uh, uh, over doors of houses, and for big buildings, uh, etc. He said, oh my gosh, if I keep selling them at this rate and carving them at this rate, there's going to be one on every house in, in Portsmouth really the first eagles he'd ever done, supposedly. Now, some may have appeared on uh, something he carved beforehand, but they were his first standalone eagles. His bread and butter eagle was a little, oh, 26 inch to 32, 34 inch carving. And uh, uh, they almost always had this don't give up the ship slogan. Some have other slogans. Merry Christmas was one. That's pretty fun. Uh, but this was one of his bigger ones. This is, a, I think, a 52-inch bird. And most were gilded. Some were painted white. This one is awfully interesting because it's actually silver instead of gold. They were often painted and decorated in navy blue and red like this is. And they had these, you know, the neck and the head were applied to the, uh, to the back, to the wings, to the outstretched wings. And if you look close here, you can see his eye, which is a trademark of a Bellamy carving, and his very fine beak and tongue. The banner is done in two parts, the streamer. And what I really like about this bird too, in addition to its uh, large scale, is its narrow and long format, which makes it great for over top of a Amer uh, framed American flag. That would be a great place to put one. <laughs> and over top of a doorway, of course, with so many going on houses. Bellamy worked right up until the time of his death. He was uh, an alcoholic, unfortunately, later in life, but he, but he produced uh, just tons of interesting things and wonderful, wonderful. The, certainly the most uh, loved carver of American eagles in the, in the antiques world. Now, I'd like to show you a couple of pictures of Bellamy, which is it's wonderful we have this sort of record of him. This photo is an early one, probably his late teens, early 20s. The most classic image of him from a daguerreotype um, is this one with him seated as a table. Maybe in his, maybe in his 30s here. And this is a picture of a firehouse in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and look at the top. Look at this huge eagle with a probably 12, maybe 14 foot wingspan. Not very different from the one uh, behind me, but much larger. Absolutely unknown in the antiques world now, though the building still stands. The firehouse is still there. In fact, it has these signs that are over the doors. And uh, today it's condominiums. <laughs> Isn't that sad? But 1.2 million apiece. So the best picture is this one. This is the inside of Bellamy's shop, his wood carving shop. 
probably in Portsmouth, showing an array of his carvings. This was a very typical one here. That's more like a typical Bellamy. Um, this is a wonderful one here with, with flags all below it. And that is a killer. I've seen those bring into the two and three hundred thousands. Wonderful with it that we have that sort of record. Now, George Staff, by contrast, was born in Columbia, Pennsylvania, along the banks of the Susquehanna River. That's on the York County, Lancaster County border in Lancaster County in 1862. That's the second year of the Civil War, by the way. So he's born during the war. At some point, he moved to Lancaster City, Lancaster proper, and he opened a confectionery. So he had a love for making candy. And he was an inventor and an ingenious guy. His father was a German engineer. And uh, at some point, he developed a way, he developed a relationship with Milton Hershey and developed a way to better stamp out Hershey bars. Um, he also sold Hershey a caramel recipe. Now, at some point, he seems to have gotten bored with that and decided to be a carpenter. And so he and his brother John moved to Harrisburg and opened a carpentry business. George had a specialty in spiral staircases. And there's one that survives today in the Dauphin County Historical Society in the home of John Harris, founder of Harrisburg and Harris County, Texas, of all things. Um, and, you know, to take a look at his eagles, if you look close, you can see the very different format. And this interesting elongated neck and much more fanciful beak. Now this isn't one of his typical birds. I'll show you one of those. This is in one of my old catalogs, 2010 wish book catalog. Um, here is a more traditional staff eagle. Typically they use this elongated neck to wrap around the staff of a diagonal American flag, waving flag, and then with a talon or talons, usually at an, another angle, held a federal shield. This one's a little bit unusual because the shield's up and down and you can't see the talons. The talons are much more shapely. Uh, you never see, uh, unless it's a standing bird, you never see talons on a, on a flying bird from, from Bellum. So these were thought to really be one of two things until about 15 years, you know, maybe 20 years ago. So where Bellamy has been known forever in the antiques world, um, staff was really unknown really 20 years ago and beyond. Um, it was thought that these were one of two things, either a Bellamy, they got attributed to Bellamy all the time just because they were good and there was more than one of them, although they're much much more rare than a Bellamy carving, and they're Pennsylvania, so what do you think my favorite is? Um, and uh, the other thing that they were thought to be is China trade eagles. The, you can see the, the, you know, the oriental influence here in the shape of the head, sort of, but he prob they probably really weren't influenced a whole lot by that. And more of just were just a folk carving of a of a Pennsylvania guy, but there had to be a little influence. Now, what's really cool about this one is that it's one of not only is it not the typical format, it has these two great big flags and a great big shield, but it's one of only two known staff examples with advertising. Um, I don't think any of the known Bellamy's have advertising. And I didn't know they existed in a staff eagle. I've since found out there's another one of the same exact type. And I think I'm probably able to sort of put together the history. So 
Chew American Eagle Tobacco is what it says. American Eagle Tobacco started out as the Barker Company in like 1848. And it changed over sometimes afterwards and uh, was owned by a guy who had a place in Detroit. He was actually mayor of Detroit for a while. And he befriended George Custer. And he got very wealthy. He was head of the yacht. He was commandant of the yacht club in, in Detroit. And he traveled back and forth between New York, where he had offices, and New Jersey, where he had tobacco production. And he would have had to go right through Harrisburg. So this was really right. He, he was peak production, 1.5 million uh, tons of tobacco. Uh, one of the biggest suppliers in the, in, in the United States. He was in peak production at the time that Staff was carving. Staff only worked from around 1890 to World War I, which in America started in 1918. Very short window. And um, now there was a uh, Union Tobacco Company had shops all over the United States, and they had two shops in Harrisburg. Absolutely, without a doubt, they would have sold American Eagle chewing tobacco. Now, Staff carved more than just uh, these little birds. He also did big ones. Bellamy did big ones, too, as you saw in the, in the image. But Staff did eagles in 1906, that went to the Pennsylvania State Capitol that were six, eight feet long, it says, or six, eight foot wingspans. I've seen in the, an image, and I can't find it, unfortunately, but I've seen an image of just monstrous carvings done by staff for this purpose. The Capitol was redone in 1906. And when it opened, I think in, in 1906 or 08, maybe they worked on it until 08, and it opened, and it, uh, there was a grand uh, presentation in 08. And uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt came to speak at it. Would have been his last year as president. So it's pretty cool to think that, you know, maybe Roosevelt went to one of the uh, union stores bought cigars and maybe even saw this exact eagle he certainly saw some of staff's eagles and probably stood above one or with them beside him um, i'd love to see a picture of him speaking there and i'm sure there is and i i've done some research so far i can't find a photo of the tobacco shops that show one of these birds uh, it looks like they were probably kept inside they could have been outside over the under an overhang of some kind, but I don't think so. The paint is just too good on them. So it's wonderful to see this unusual format bird and uh, one that uh, 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 has actual advertising on it. Unlike Bellamy, we don't have a surviving image of George Staff. I do know that one exists because I know his great-grandson. I've talked to him extensively as a historian, a very good guy, and he knows that he has a photo of him. He lived on 14th Street in Harrisburg, and he had a little carving shop behind his house. The house is still there, but the, the shop is not. But, there, but his great-grandson has an image of him standing in front of the Allison Hill School with a line of carved eagles in various sizes, from miniature to, to his bread and butter ones to, to larger. He would often, he said, do a presentation at the school for the kids, very patriotic guy. And uh, I've been after that image for years, but he doesn't know where it is and can't find it. So always gives me something else to look forward to and... Uh, uh, I can't wait to uh, come up with a little bit more on George Staff. There's never been an article written on him that I know of, specifically on him, and where there are whole books on Bellamy and many other books that show Bellamy's. So I think this is the really 
the, the prize lot of these two, although they're both just wonderful. And I'm so excited to have them right at the same time and be able to tell you this great tale of two eagles. Thanks for listening and, uh, and having a look, and hope to see you soon.